Have you ever wondered about the true dangers lurking behind seemingly perfect relationships? Join me as we delve into the chilling true story of Deborah New and John Meehan, a tale of deceit, danger, and survival. A wealthy businesswoman, Deborah New, successful in the interior design sector, founded Ambrosia after 30 years of hard work. Despite her accomplishments, her romantic life was marred by past family tragedy. Her sister Cindy was murdered by Billy Vickers in 1984, causing Deborah acute anxiety about firearms. She lived alone, surrounded by luxury, seeking a loving partner. A chance encounter with a charismatic anesthesiologist ignited a passionate relationship, offering hope for the family bliss she longed for but had yet to find amidst her financial success and personal struggles. John Meehan, born in California in 1958, engaged in fraudulent activities and substance dealing leading to his banishment from California in 1988. Despite graduating from Arizona State University and marrying nurse Tanya Sells in 1990, their relationship was built on lies. John's addiction to stolen pills and his deceitful past led to his eventual confrontation with law enforcement, fleeing to Michigan, where he attempted suicide. John was arrested in Missouri and sentenced to six years in Michigan for resisting arrest and drug possession, but he served only 17 months and was released in 2004. It was during this time that he met Deborah, who was 55 and had just started online dating. Deborah liked John's online profile as a divorced doctor and Christian seeking love. After several unsatisfactory dates, Deborah was pleasantly delighted when John exhibited real interest in her life, praised her accomplishments, and seemed different. They met in October 2014 at Houston in Irvine, California. John used fictitious stories about his history, including working with Doctors Without Borders in Iraq, having two children, and owning various houses, to captivate Deborah. Deborah imagined a selfless doctor dedicated to global service. John made her feel like a queen, something Deborah craved, and he even wanted to meet her family. His charming words made Deborah's heart flutter and overwhelmed by the attention and flattery they found themselves at her penthouse after leaving the restaurant. But John overstepped boundaries on this occasion. After a few kisses, he sought to escalate things, but Deborah, uncomfortable with the pressure, asked him to leave the following morning. John called Deborah to apologize and explained that he had consumed too much alcohol and couldn't con. This statement increased John's status in Deborah's eyes, leading to the continuation of their dates. As their relationship grew, Deborah and John spent more time together. On their third date, John confessed his love and proposed. Deborah was so happy with their friendship that she missed several oddities. Jayan donned his faded, rather dirty medical scrubs to Deborah's beautiful charity event. John came in his scrubs, saying he had no time to change, but Deborah didn't mind, and proudly presented him as her doctor to friends. They took photographs together and agreed to move in together. Deborah's daughter, Jacine, who lived in the penthouse with her, was candid about her mother's partners. She didn't like John's unclean robes, and thought it unusual that her Gucci-wearing mother was dating someone in them. John's unusual pen passion caught Jacqueline's attention. Houses, sculptures, and artworks, as if assessing their value. John convinced Deborah to live apart. Five weeks after meeting, they rented a house for $6,500 a month on Balboa Island's waterfront in Newport. Deborah paid $80,000 upfront for several months' rent. While John avoided putting his name on the layers of cheating tax complications, Deborah was so smitten that she covered it all. Expenses unbeknownst to her children, she couldn't fat home her children's disapproval of John as he pampered her like royalty preparing morning coffee, grocery shopping. And Deborah was confident she had met her perfect mate in Joan and hoped her children would warm up to him, visualizing a harmonic family anxious to bridge this gap. Deborah wanted John to meet her younger daughter Tara, who was kinder than Jacqueline. Tara was living in Las Vegas with her boyfriend when she heard about John over the phone and decided to meet him in person. Her visit coincided with Deborah and John's move into their new home. Tara felt uneasy about John's lack of courtesy and his silent, solitary efforts to move belongings as he tried to project a tough exterior. Despite her reservations, Tara was willing to give John the benefit of the doubt. She instantly saw worrying signals. John didn't drive and claimed to have residences in Newport Beach and Palm Springs, but he never recommended moving or invited them to visit. John spent much of his time at home playing video games. Before Thanksgiving, Tara snooped through her mother's boyfriend's belongings and found a nurse's certificate with his name, realizing he wasn't a doctor. John was furious and threw a massive tantrum, 
accusing Tara of trying to deprive her mother of happiness and shouting that she wouldn't succeed in separating them while Deborah listened. After a big argument, Tara left the house. JN convinced Deborah that her children wanted her fortune till she died and didn't want her to be happy. On Thanksgiving Eve, Deborah's pious mother Arlene came. John performed a religious act for her, but he got another scandal, and the holiday ended in another fiasco. Deborah sought help from a psychotherapist, who advised her to set limits with her children and live a peaceful life. She and JN moved to Balboa Island, where they ate at local restaurants, walked around, and enjoyed the scenery. Deborah was thrilled, but she worried about John's old medical clothes. John claimed his finer garments were pilfered during a stint in Iraq, so Deborah escorted him on a shopping spree and bought him a complete set of high-end designer outfits in early December JN, accompanied Deborah on a work-related trip to Las Vegas. By this time their acquaintance was just under two months old, but they chose to marry. An unknown woman entered John and Deborah's home, but Deborah didn't tell her children. John used this event to convince Deborah to increase security. His smartphone controlled many surveillance cameras in their house and in his wife's office to monitor her actions. John wanted to progressively manage their surroundings. Deborah asked about his family and past, and JN always had an answer, even when there were contradictions. Deborah ignored them, believing she had found her perfect mate despite her children's doubts. John's lack of a car prompted Jacqueline to investigate. Deborah's Tesla Jacqueline installed tracking devices on the car to monitor his whereabouts. But this didn't reveal anything significant, so she and Tarara hired a private investigator. The detective found that John had declared bankruptcy, had a nursing license but not a medical license, and had lived in Arizona, Ohio, and Indiana. The daughters shared these discoveries with their mother, and Deborah said that even if these facts were true, her love for him would remain the same. In late March, Deborah received a letter from a former prison inmate but she couldn't read it because John grabbed it and accused her of mistrust in a fit of anger. Deborah was unhappy about this answer. So the next day when her husband was at work, she searched his belongings and found shocking realities about him. After she married, Deborah discovered that John was an ex-nurse anesthetist who had become addicted to painkillers and lost his job. Court records showed that John had cheated and stolen from many women he met online. In the court files, John's storage unit was searched and found to contain a 38 caliber CT handgun, a GPS tracker, syringes, and other suspicious items. Deborah realized that John was a dangerous armed felon with multiple restraining orders from different women. She was horrified to find he had been released from prison on October 8th to see her. Days after being stunned by the disclosures, Deborah carefully reviewed the paperwork. Experiencing astonishment and anxiety as she realized John might harm her and her children. Acting normally temporarily, Deborah waited until John left for the hospital due to back issues. Then she and her family moved out during his absence. During the packing process, they found more of John's PRS of online comments from other women warning about him. They portrayed John as a persuasive and adept deceiver, cautioning others not to be SW. Weighed by his attractiveness and charm convinced of his instability, Deborah resolved to end their relationship and leave. Despite her decision, John persistently messaged her pleading for her to visit him in the hospital, overcome with guilt. Deborah relented by June 2015. John successfully persuaded Deborah to reconcile. He offered numerous justifications for the oddities. Found among his possessions, he admitted to concealing his past, believing that a woman of her, her stature wouldn't have noticed him. Otherwise, he had feigned being a doctor to impress her, and now implored her assistance to rehabilitate and salvage his life still enamored. Deborah granted him another chance. They relocated to a new apartment in Irvine together. This decision deeply troubled her children, leading the couple to maintain a distance from them. Temporarily, March 2016 had arrived, and the couple had been married for a year and three months. Deborah had been helping John to recover from his addiction but she was distressed by the fact that her entire family hated him, especially Jacine. And this hatred was mutual. It got to the point where her husband forbade. Deborah from seeing her daughter when John found out that Deborah was paying for Jacqueline's real estate lessons, he called the school and slandered the girl in front of the teachers. In addition to this, he wrote her threatening and indecent messages, saying that her mother didn't want anything to do with her, and that one day he would come and end Jacqueline. It seemed that John was recovering. 
but at the same time, he was becoming even more evil and cruel. In April 2016, Deborah reached her limit of patience and filed for divorce. She wanted to peacefully break off the relationship, so she started to gradually withdraw money from her bank account to keep it safe. However, in her hiding place in one of the lower drawers, there was $30,000 when JN discovered this money. He claimed that these funds also belonged to him. The man realized that the case was heading towards divorce and began to show aggression. Deborah realized she needed to flee and took some of her cosmetics and work items to Jacqueline's Irvine apartment, where she felt safe because the complex had many surveillance cameras. The Orange County judge denied her request for a restraining order because there was no immediate threat. John resided out of state, so she had to split up and move on after his separation. J.N. moved to Deborah's Nevada property and tried to contact her. She ignored his calls and took a new strategy. John took a drastic step on June 11, 2016, when Deborah drove her Jaguar to work while she was at the office. The car was stolen from the parking lot and found drenched in gasoline about a block and a half away. Despite the intent, the car had only minor damage since it hadn't been set. Ablaze. The area's CCTV camera clearly identified John Meehan as the thief on August 20, 2016, when Tara got home from work and parked in the lot. John abruptly attacked her with a knife, trying to drag her back into the car. As John covered her lips, Tara shouted for aid and bit him hard, starting a violent fight. Heavy boots helped Tara kick her assailant and remove the dagger from his clutches. She took a minute to decide and stabbed John 13 times, piercing his eye and causing him to tremble with astonishment. Tara was saved by a neighbor who gave her a towel and contacted the police. John was still alive and had a pulse when paramedics arrived in his car. They found duct tape, cable ties, kitchen knives, and a passport, suggesting he meant to kidnap Tara and depart the city with her. John Meehan died in the hospital after being injured. He died four days later, age 57, and was cremated without a memorial service since everyone hated him. Deborah and her children were traumatized by everything. It took time for the woman to return to regular life, but she still feels guilty for bringing a criminal home. Deborah is now very cautious and carries a stun gun and pepper spray to protect herself. She declared that she would never meet someone online again based on John Meehan's story, which was filmed on the crime series Dirty John. If you like this story, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new videos. Please like and comment. See you next video.